Hey everyone, welcome to Fighting Over the Card Catalog, a snarky look back on young adult novels of the 80s and 90s. I'm Jess. I'm Stephen, and I'm here to make my wife happy. We're taking a journey to find out how many terrible and hopefully some not so terrible books from my youth I can get my husband to read before he reconsiders this whole marriage. Hello, love. Hey, witch lady. Witch lady? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm just saying stuff from the book. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm like, wow, what I do? Okay, thanks. So, uh, yeah, we're going to go through. Uh, you had a good week? I had a good week. <laughs> <laughs> do it short and short. Yeah, we're going to do a short one because we got to watch the first debate <laughs> in a little over an hour and eat dinner. Um, I had my first infusion for my MS and it was great. It's doing well. Yep. Yeah. You? You built bookcases. There built will be bookcases. pictures. Yeah. There will be pictures soon. They're I pretty wonderful. much finished, yeah. That was yeah. good. Yeah. I'm excited. It's positive. Had my third photography class. That was nice. Yeah. All right. All right. So this week's book <laughs> is Anastasia Again by Lois Lowry, published in 1981. <laughs> Upon learning that her family plans to move to the suburbs, Anastasia, that undaunted, precocious heroine of Anastasia Krupnik, declares, as soon as I finish this chocolate pudding, I'm going to jump out the window. Eventually, with her parents and brother Sam, she hesitatingly goes to her new surroundings, bringing a mystery that she's been writing, the mystery of saying goodbye. But as Anastasia soon learns, moving involves not only saying goodbye, but also meeting new friends like Crazy Gertrude Stein next door, the witch, Uh, Steve, an attractive tennis player down the block, and the people at the Senior Citizens Drop-In Center. In Anastasia again, uh, Louise Lowry... Lois. (laughs) Lois. <laughs> Lois Lowry has created a totally engaging heroine and her warm, supportive family as she once again explores the incredible life-giving link that exists between the very young and the very old. So, yeah. So, we have read Anastasia. We've met Anastasia before. And I'm pretty sure you liked her. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I think and she's even I better like this in one. this one. Yeah. yeah. As well. Uh, I did read that she was on the the series was number twenty nine on the most challenged books uh, on the list of one hundred most challenged books from nineteen ninety to two thousand. Uh-huh. And reasons were because obviously this is aimed toward kids, but there are casual um, <laughs> thoughts of suicide uh, mm. about killing yourself, like jumping out of the window, yeah. like it just yeah. said. Um, there are. <laughs> Um, she drinks beer. She drinks the foam off the of foam her desk. off beer, and yeah. it it mentions Playboys. Uh huh. Yeah. And explicit sex. So much explicit <laughs> sex. And she says the word explicit sex. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, when the first one is like, she says, you know, they talk about sex and stuff, and. Like, she reads books in her house that have sex in it, and it's no biggie. Um, because she has awesome parents. And, yeah. So, I mean, that's the reason for me to love it. Yeah. And I think any good parents love <laughs> it, too. I can see how the um, the casual uh, mentions of suicide would give some people pause yeah um i also see how totally um who people who are totally isolated and controlled by their parents they wouldn't want them to even Mm. know what a playboy was or that kids were allowed to be anywhere near beer yeah i mean i know i know one of my brothers would not even allow his children to bring him a beer are you an, serious? An opened beer, much less, yeah, much less get a sip from one. Wow. Yeah. That's really sad that somebody's so scared of, I don't know, doesn't that say more about your parenting? I'm getting very judgy now, but. 
I mean, I, I, I think so, because anytime you ignore a subject, it makes it more appealing, yeah. more attractive for them to yeah. figure out why. It just spikes curiosity. Yeah. And, then, and then, like with a lot of subjects, once they figure out, well, what's the big deal with this? And then it's like, well, what else has he been telling me that's not so bad? Right. Maybe heroin is not so bad after <laughs> all. I should try it. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So just for listeners know, it's better to talk about subjects with your kids rather than completely banned yeah, subjects. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, scale of one best book ever to Dementor's Kiss of ten. Um, this would probably be two. Same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was an, it was an enjoyable read because she's... Um, She's written as a more well. Actually, most of the characters are written as a more mature, almost like they're writing for young adults rather than for mm-hmm. children. Even though the main characters are children, mm-hmm. I mean, even the 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 youngest son, Sam. I mean, uh, it's kind of unrealistic in a way because yeah. he at times, at times, uh, sometimes he's he seems like a baby. Right. But at other times, he's very um, mentally ahead of right. of where anybody would be. But at that's his what age. makes him but, so interesting. Yeah, like if he were just completely precocious and like had toilet training down all already and all that stuff, that wouldn't be interesting. Yeah. But it's just his verbal and right um, understanding of things. There's probably a better word for that. But so, all right, you ready to get into it? Sure, let's, let's go get into it. All right. So yeah, Anastasia's back, y'all. Um, she's now twelve years old and five foot seven, which she is not a fan of, because um, that's pretty tall for a twelve year old, mm. and it makes her stand out for a twelve year old girl. Yeah. Well, even for guys, I guess. Um, yeah, she is not a fan. She's got skinny legs, and she's just not down with herself right now. And she's got oily hair. She's just going through puberty, just hardcore poor yeah. thing. Um, she eventually starts. Washing her hair twice a day, which is not good. Um, that just makes things oilier. Now, that I may not completely know when it comes to puberty, but... Yeah, Jonathan Van Ness from Queer Eye says you should only wash your hair, like, twice a week. And so now I do. And, yeah, my hair is less oily. Because it, like, strips the oils from your natural oils from your hair and that you need. So it, like, overproduces if you wash it too much. Anyway, that's Beauty Talk with Jess. Thank you yeah. very much. <laughs> so our pubescent Anastasia is pretty upset at the beginning of this book. Her family is going to be moving to the suburbs. And yeah, Anastasia says she's rather be dead and comes up with all sorts of reasons why moving to the suburbs is a bad idea. She's got all these stereotypical ideas from like books and TV and magazines and stuff like all the rooms are have cute matching furniture. Uh, there aren't any bookcases and split level houses, which is all they have in the suburbs. Um, they have meaningful paintings on their walls there in Cambridge, and they just have stupid reproduced stuff in the suburbs. And they'll have to have a car for Pete's <laughs> sake. They would pollute the atmosphere with a car. Thank you for being woke even way back then, Anastasia. <laughs> Uh, ladies in the suburbs only wear cute cotton dresses from Lord and Taylor. Her yeah. mom won't be able to wear jeans anymore. And they play bridge every afternoon and have affairs with the neighbor's husbands. So she's all worked up. <laughs> so she's tasked with getting Sam up from his nap after she finds out this news. So she tells him they're moving. But she doesn't get the reaction from him she wants. So she takes his blanket and says the movers aren't going to move it. And he starts freaking out because it's such an old blanket and kind of dirty. And she's like, they're not going to move this. And he starts freaking out and crying. And so she yells at her parents, I just told Sam the news. Can you hear him? He doesn't want to move to the suburbs (laughs) either. (laughs) I love her so much. I love how she's aware of her manipulation of sulking and how she has perfected the art of it. Um, She make sure that the essential point that people had to know you're doing it so you have to leave the door open and make sure you're visible from the door thank you 
Um, it doesn't work, though. So there's no list in this book, um, like the last book and oh, most yeah. of the other ones. But she is writing a mystery novel. First thing is a title. So she begins with, The Mystery of Why People Make Decisions Without Consulting Their 12-Year-Old Children. And titles, Chapter 1, Decisions About Moving to the uh, Suburbs. (laughs) Um, But she got so mad just thinking about that, she didn't write anything else. Um, Her parents tell her that, awesome parents, tell her that she's making unreasonable assumptions. And Anastasia says she never makes anything, not since a potholder in third grade. Thank you. (laughs) So her other problem is her little brother, Sam. Like we were saying before, he's not like other two-year-olds. He speaks in totally complete sentences and has a huge vocabulary. But he's still, like we said, you know... Uh, takes naps and isn't body trained yet and just normal two year old things but Anastasia says he's so weird it's going to be a disaster to move him to the suburbs I love the way Lois Lowry writes her she you know how when people are teaching writing or whatever they say show don't tell I think Lois is a master of that like in this paragraph um they says and by fall they might be living in the suburbs her eyes behind her glasses began to blur terrific now she's going blind on top of everything Hmm. else that wasn't a bad thought though it made her smile to herself and she pictured her seeing eye dog tearing robert giannini's briefcase to shreds with his teeth and then starting in on robert giannini himself she grinned and her vision came back so, I love just that subtle yeah. saying, you know, she's starting to cry, but she doesn't actually say it. And, yeah. you know. In, in a very descriptive way, and then the way she smiles about yeah. about the thought that comes with it. You know, yeah, it was, I love it was that. very good. And she does that a lot, especially when she's talking about, like, um, how she doesn't like boys. But the way she phrases it is like, well, obviously she does. But she does not just the way her inner uh, monologue <laughs> um, yeah. contrasts with what's really going on. The awesome parents let her help them make a list of what they want for the house. And Anastasia hopes that they can't find a house that'll meet their requirements. Maybe they'll just stay put. Yeah. So, <laughs> so she gives them one that's really off the wall. Yeah. Well, it's not yeah. off the wall, but... Is one she thinks. I mean, how many houses do you see with this feature? Yeah, she wants a tower. Um, but like, hi, you're living in New England. There are Victorian houses. Um, and her mom wants lots of light and a room for her own to paint. And her father wants a study that he can put lots of bookshelves in, or that has lots of bookshelves. But yeah, Anastasia's like, we won't be able to find this house. It's fine. So, as previously mentioned, Robert Giannini, a boy from her school, calls Anastasia one day and asks her to go ride bikes by the river and look for junk to collect. (laughs) Anastasia thinks he's really weird and a jerk. The word jerk gets thrown around a lot in this era as a a catch-all insult. Like, not even, not just this book, but like... Lots of books of this era, I think. But anyway, she thinks he's a jerk because he carries a briefcase all the time. But she gets all nervous about what she's going to wear and her hair and what they're going to talk about when they meet up. And she starts to wear a Boston is for lovers shirt. Hmm. And then is mortified that she almost did so. Then they meet up, and they go down by the river, and they have a pretty good time. And Robert even finds a playboy, but he tries to hide it from Anastasia. She doesn't say anything. Because, again, mortifying. And she finds a Hot Wheel with a missing tire for Sam and a matchbook. And this sounds like a pretty fun date to me. Yeah. (laughs) They people watch, and I mean, they're in Cambridge, so there's lots of... Cambridge, Massachusetts, by the way. Let me make that clear. (laughs) Um, Like where Harvard is. And yeah. So it's very diverse and there's lots of good people watching. 
And Anastasia's like, I'm totally going to miss all this when we move to the suburbs. And so she tells Robert about how they're probably moving. And he's all, you'll have to go to a new school and you won't know anybody. You Hmm. won't have any friends. It's like, Robert, you are being a jerk here. She gives him the impression that Sam is (laughs) deformed. Because she tells Robert that her little brother's weird. And she tries to explain him like her father has and saying some parts of him didn't develop as quickly as others. Huh. <laughs> um, his brain is in good shape, but some other parts of him aren't so good. You know, meaning, yeah, his brain is developed <laughs> very well, but the rest of him is just normal. But right. um, that it doesn't come off that way, saying it that way to a, somebody who doesn't know him. But Robert says he understands because he has a cousin who is developmentally delayed. Um, So he gets it about Sam being disabled. Now, they use other language here that I don't want to use. But, yeah, 1981, you can imagine. What? Yeah, I was (laughs) thinking about if I was going to say it. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I'd rather not. The whole family's going to go look at a house. Um, Awesome parents have already been looking for a while. And awesome mom, even by herself, like 12 different houses. And Anastasia's like, that sounds fucking terrible. But um, before they go, Anastasia and Sam come up with this plot where um, he's going to cry and say he's allergic to the house. And Sam's like, yeah, I'm all in. (laughs) But on the way there, Anastasia starts to feel funny. Uh, She thinks she might be getting carsick. But realizes that, uh uh-oh, it might actually be because she's falling in love with what she sees in the suburbs. Mm. Like dogs and kids playing outside and... Actual yards. Actual yards. All that good stuff. And then they pull up to the house. And guess what? It's a big Victorian with a tower. Or, as we learned last time in my sweet Audrina, a cupola. She never calls it that, but I'm assuming that's what it is. And it has everything else on their list. It's it's got the study, and it's got a big solarium that'll be great for Awesome Mom Studio. And so none of them say anything as they walk through because they're just like speechless. That is so perfect. But the real estate lady says she hates (laughs) things. Thinks they hate it. Yeah, that was good. She was going through and. Things that she thought was uh, were all negatives. Yeah. Well, I can't believe they put these big, giant windows in these rooms. You could always just close this room off, or better yet, yeah. take it take it off or to save your energy down. bills. Yeah. Like all these awful renovations, yeah. and she finally just gives up and lights a cigarette. Walks into the study, and it's filled with book bookshelves, and the dad's speechless, and she's, she's like, like oh. "You can just take all these out; it'll look like a much larger room yeah. if you do." And it's like, (laughs) sacrilege, bitch. You don't understand these people. But it's okay. Because it's absolutely perfect. And her dad's like, yep, we're going to buy it. And frankly, I also fall in love with the description of this house and the illustration at the beginning of the chapter. It's just a typical big old Victorian house that I love. That I know I can't live in anymore. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. But... I can and still I wouldn't love want them. to. I wouldn't want energy bills. No. And I wouldn't want upkeep. No. Yeah, can you imagine? We would have to close off rooms. I mean, yeah. we close the vent in our guest room when people <laughs> aren't here. <laughs> but that's air conditioning in Texas. So we need a new cha- uh, title for her book. So she tries out the mystery of why you sometimes hate the idea of something, but then you like the thing itself. Subtitled. Or why you sometimes like the idea of something, but hate the thing itself. Moving in the new house fell into the first category. And Robert Giannini fell into the second. Poor Robert Giannini. So before they move, everyone's finding leaving their apartment a bit hard in their own ways. Um, Awesome Mom's packing up the pantry and getting sad because she's going to miss the stained glass window cabinets in there and Mm. it was sam's nursery when he was first born and anastasia gets a little sad about that too she goes in to see him and he's all upset because he says his blanket wants to stay there 
So Anastasia cuts it in half and puts one piece away up in a corner of, of a shelf in a closet. I'm like, that's a very lovely idea. I hope the new people don't throw it out. <laughs> Why would they not throw an old ready They may not see towel. it. <laughs> I hope they don't see it. I'll say that. Um, and Anastasia knows she's going to miss her kick-ass wallpaper. Uh, she picked this out when she was eight. It has people riding old-fashioned bicycles on it. Some of them were playing flutes and violins as they rode. The lady in the long skirt who rode a unicycle and played a violin was named Sybil. The man on the old-fashioned racing bike who rode no hands and played a flute was Stanley. Stanley had been chasing Sybil around the walls of her old bedroom for years. I just love that. <laughs> That's the kind of shit I adore. Um, and even awesome mom's like, oh yeah, I always thought Stanley had a sexy little mustache. <laughs> But anyways, Anastasia just, she can't deal with the thought of someone else living in it with Stanley and Sybil. So she goes and writes in a corner by the floor, this is my room forever, Anastasia hmm. Krupnik. And then she goes and finds her dad looking all forlorn in his study. But she sees, oh, he's written his name on the wall too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love awesome parents so much. They're probably my favorite parents from maybe all literature, really. She finally cries when she says goodbye to her best friend, Jenny McCauley, over the phone. And she they make promises to each other like, okay, don't ever go see Casablanca in theaters if it comes without me. And uh, uh, call me if you meet any boys and all this. It's very dramatic 12-year-old stuff, but I understand. Because uh, I moved when I was 12, and that's uh, well, it's one of the times I yeah. moved. But when I moved from Connecticut to Minnesota, that was the hardest because I was 12 or almost 12. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was, I think, nine, nine when I moved, and I had only been at one school. Yeah. And that was in fourth grade. And then we moved during the school year. Yeah, that makes it worse. We only ever moved in summer. Yeah. So that was easier. But did you cry when I mean you oh, yeah. moved a lot. But. Yeah, but that was the that was a really I moved when I was four or five mm -hmm. from one house to another. Mm -hmm. But still went to the same school. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we moved when I was nine to a completely different area where I knew nobody. Yeah. 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 So yeah. That was that was the big, that was the the biggest of the of the moves, mm -hmm. and then I guess when my mom uh, got remarried, and we moved to a different school mm -hmm. um, that time because I had gone, I had gone back. We we actually moved back to the city. I the school I had went I had gone to kindergarten through fourth grade. Then I moved back in the middle of fifth grade. Mm -hmm. And was there fifth, sixth, seventh, and then in the eighth grade, I was moved to another school. Yeah. Um, that was that. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, that was a bad time because <laughs> yeah, there was just a lot going on and all the changes going on in my teenage body. Right. It made it so much worse. Yeah, I yeah. guess I was thirteen then. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was that was really bad. Yeah, we moved at the end of sixth grade. And, yeah. But my first move from Connecticut to Texas, I remember not being happy there. Like, I miss Texas a lot. Uh -huh. But I don't remember, I mean, I may have, but I don't remember dreading the move mm -hmm. so much. You know, honestly, that may be because um, the Babysitter's Club was based in Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> And I'd been reading them for a couple of years by then, so that legit may have been why. But um, nice, yeah. I did not like though. My parents went up to look for a house without me and my brother because mm. it was so far, you know. And I think signing contracts or something, and yeah. I don't know. Do you but stay yeah. with your grandparents? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but they did take pictures of the house they found in my school and the lake and all that sort of stuff. So that was pretty dope. That was good nice. for them. Good job, parents. But yeah, I was, when we moved to Minnesota, I was just distraught at leaving my good friends. Yeah. Because, I mean, like, your friendships are so intense 
at that age. Sure. You know? Plus, we were leaving when my dog died. <laughs> like, mm. right before we were leaving, I went and sat and cried in the spot where she died. Because <laughs> that was very dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fine. <laughs> so, she's decided on her real title for the book, though, with all this. The Mystery of Saying Goodbye. That's a damn good title. So they move. And her parents suffer from post-move depression. <laughs> they think the movers have stolen all this shit they can't find. Like Birdie's Requiem album and their pictures. Awesome mom can't make tea. And awesome dad's very upset about it. <laughs> so to cool them down, Anastasia offers to go next door to Sam and ask the neighbor if they have a picture they can borrow. Yeah, it was funny that she was the one telling them, you just have post-move depression. <laughs> yeah, because she read this in... Cosmo. Cosmo. <laughs> she has read a lot of things in Cosmo <laughs> that are shaping her thoughts. Yeah, um, that's kind of a that's kind of a good um, storytelling mechanic to say that somebody reads this magazine that yeah. has all these off the wall articles. <laughs> you never know if there actually has ever been one uh-huh. of these stories before, but you could pause be say anything you ever wanted to put into mm-hmm. that this person knows because yeah, because I read it. Look, I, I can cite it. my yeah. sources. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have magazines that you read regularly when you were like that age? Um, I would get Sports Illustrated. Mm-hmm. When I was younger, I got highlights, but oh, not, same. not by that time. Mm-hmm. It seems like there might have been others, but Sports Illustrated is the only mm-hmm. one I can actually recall at this moment. So did you learn anything to like shape your life like Cosmo did for <laughs> from that? Well, I, I will say that my mom got magazines that I would, you know, there would be articles that would catch my attention. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And anytime we went to like a doctor's office or something, I was right, right. scanning for yeah. I remember reading National Geographic a lot. Yeah, we and got I think the, that's a. I think that's one mm-hmm. my mom got. We got that in Ms. Magazine as in yeah. Glorious Dinos. <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I also, when I was 10, I got a subscription to Seventeen Magazine. Ah. And I had one all the way up until I was 17. Did Once I actually their, turned that age. Did you I have their posters all over your wall? No, they that wasn't a poster one. That no? was more like Tiger Beat and stuff. Oh, okay. The little cheaper ones. Um, no, 17 was more articles and fashion. All right. And that sort of stuff. And it definitely did. <laughs> yeah. I learned lots of stuff from yeah. there. It wasn't as, like, scandalous as an adult. Sure. As Cosmo could be. So, but... It tracks that Anastasia would be reading that instead. Um, but yeah, I love that. I love 17 and mm. teen. I got teen too, which was very similar. Um, and then there was a short lived Jane magazine, which was cooler. And yeah, it was just cooler than 17. Um, but it didn't last very long. I think 17 still going. So she offers to go next door. <laughs> Um, Sam says a witch lives there. He saw her looking out the window. Uh, and when they get over there, Anastasia can see why. Uh, she's got like big old bushy gray hair and not the prettiest, I guess. <laughs> but her name is Gertrude Stein. Um, but Sam calls her Gertrude Stein, like Frankenstein. Hmm. And uh, she's real prickly with Anastasia, but she really likes Sam. Uh, the two of them even make a date to go walking the next day. <laughs> Awesome parents are very trusting. <laughs> mm, yeah. Could you imagine um, parents now letting a two-year-old just go walking with a neighbor? Yeah, so when they, they really haven't, haven't even, even met. met. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's okay. She doesn't do anything weird. Um, that we know of. That we know of. <laughs> but Anastasia is actually a little bit jealous that Gertrude Stein likes Sam and not her. Oh, yeah, because she was like... When she opened the door, she was like, oh, what do you want? Yeah. And Grumpy old lady. Yeah. And she was like, oh, we need to borrow a picture. I don't have one. <laughs> Started closing the door. Then she saw Sam. And then she saw Sam. And she's like. Come here, little boy. <laughs> did she say, what's that? <laughs> yeah, she did. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. she ended up saying she she liked little kids, not so much in between Yeah, middle-sized ones. Yeah. Like, okay. 
I'm the opposite way, but I get you. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Uh, but Awesome Mom uh, explains that to her. And um, by telling her, you know, she seems lonely. And lonely people have often been let down by somebody. And Sam's unlikely to disappoint her. But Anastasia might. And it's like, dag, that makes a lot of sense. But Anastasia decides to buy Gertrude Stein a goldfish because Frank has never let her down, Frank her goldfish, and she's like, yeah, and maybe that'll help her trust me a bit, so. But man, they just throw goldfish just all over the place in books from this era, Mm. too, don't they? Yeah. (laughs) How many goldfish have we come up with? Yeah. Against in the podcast I mean, in our twenty seven episodes. When I was younger, they goldfish were everywhere. They just mm. they just had them sitting on shelves sometimes in teeny tiny bowls. I mean, in they still teeny, do teeny tiny bowls. Um, you could find them at you go to a fair, and there was always yeah. something where you get to yeah. throw something into the. It's just the rude. Yeah, uh, yeah, um, and. Beta fish, too? Is that yeah, what they are? Yeah, beta fish, yeah. yeah. They have those Yeah, we had lot. both. I had both of those. Um, and we did not take them when we moved to Connecticut, mm. but we left them with our very nice neighbors. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm sure they took great care of them. They were a very nice older couple. <laughs> I had guppies. Guppies. And they I probably couldn't pick out a guppy. Well. And uh, why not? Yeah. <laughs> it's a little tiny, little tiny fish. So, I'm going to read to you through this, the novel, (laughs) as she, her final draft of it. So, chapter one. Once there was a young girl who who had had in her short life of 12 years to say goodbye many times. Her grandmother had died and her goldfish had been flushed down the toilet and was irretrievable even though plumbers had been called. She had said goodbye to her grandmother two ways. One, by going to the funeral, which was okay even though it was sad. And two, by keeping her grandmother's wedding ring, which was given to her, and looking at it now and then, which made her remember her grandmother in a nice sort of way. And she had said goodbye to her goldfish by holding memorial services over the toilet bowl and playing taps on her harmonica. Her father had sung, Many brave hearts are asleep in the deep, But one day, she had to say goodbye to the house she had lived in in all her life. Actually, it was an apartment, but apartments can feel like houses. And this young girl's apartment had always felt like a house to her. That was the hardest goodbye of all, because there was no funeral, no souvenir to keep, no memorial service, no harmonica music, no final flesh. Also, it became complicated because at the same time, she had to adapt to the new house. This young girl was not a very adaptable person. And a footnote. For reasons that scientists have not yet figured out, goldfish seem to be more adaptable than young girls. Hmm. (laughs) So when she gets home from um, buying Gertrude Stein's goldfish, she returns a call from Robert because he looked her up in information. I mean, what? That happened really fast. How quick are you listed I mean, for one thing, that's not a thing. I mean, is it a thing anymore? I don't know. Well, I mean, you can call information as soon as somebody gets a phone number. It'll right. be listed. It just won't be in the phone book. Right. Okay. So he could call It seems like they got hooked up pretty quick. Yeah, uh, that's... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> they could have... They, they probably could have called ahead of time and said, oh, we yeah. need to be hooked yeah, up yeah. even before they moved true, to the true, nails, true. probably. Um, but is that a thing people do anymore? It's possible to do. How would you even do it? To do information? Yeah. I think it's just calling 411 or something like that. Oh, yeah, that is information. Yeah. I want to do you used it. To, when I was a kid, you had to call the operator. Right. Was that, that just pressing zero? It was just dialing zero or pressing right. zero. Uh, okay. It was dialing zero when I was... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so she has, she returns this call, and she knows the number by heart because she looked it up a hundred times, mm. but only because she was bored. No other reason. Huh. <laughs> and they have an awkwardly cute conversation, and Robert's like, yeah, I could come out to see you sometime. I looked it up on the map. It's not so far. Awesome Dad's getting fed up with Anastasia saying weird 
she said it like 4,000 yeah. times that week. I like that one. And she, he insists she finds another one to use. Um, because they have tons of books and dictionaries by God. Throws a bunch of synonyms at her. Ending with phantasmagorical, which I really love. Um, did you have any forbidden words? Not like swear words, but words your parents didn't like you saying. Um, or got annoyed with you saying. No. No, just swear words, I think. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, in our house it was shut up. We had that one too. You were not allowed to say shut up mm-hmm. and you were not allowed to say stupid. Mm-mm. Yeah. We weren't allowed to say but either. <laughs> which made um, this, the Simpsons like a bone of contention for a little while between my parents and my dad loved it. And we yeah. were allowed to watch it, but my mom didn't like them. They said uh, but a lot in it. Yeah. <laughs> but really, uh, along the lines of like, well, I just did it. Of the weird um, is saying like, I remember my dad and I having a very heated conversation at least once over dinner with my saying like so much. Mm. He's like, <laughs> see, I still do yep. it. Apparently, it didn't stick or I'm still rebelling. But, <laughs> mm. you know, his argument was, is it like something or is it actually something, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, I can see that. He would throw that at me a lot. Um, but, Yeah. It didn't do any good, apparently, so... Yeah, it's like, the same whatever. as <laughs> Telling my kids I could do something. <laughs> so it's just a that. dad thing, huh? It's a dad smart-ass thing. Yeah, it's you know, it's really, it's trying to get somebody to think, change yeah. their habits. Yeah, because it is just a habit. And why, but, but it, you know, it's kind of, yeah, I mean, it, there is a reason why. Yeah, yeah, because it is. Yeah. That is what it means. And but but I can also, remember Megan just getting exasperated with me one time. It, you know what I mean. Yes, girl. <laughs> See, that's probably the same thing that I'm remembering. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How old was she? Oh, probably. She was probably around 10 at the time. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, it's probably a universal problem. <laughs> So, Anastasia takes uh, the goldfish over to Gertrude Stein's house and says it's Anastasia again. And that's where we get the title for our book. Because Gertrude Stein peers out and says, Anastasia again? It looks like Anastasia Krupnik to me. Ha! Old lady jokes. (laughs) But she seems to really like her present. And she does open up to Anastasia a bit. And he tells her she's going to name him Mr. Stein. Because he looks like her ex. He had big old goggly goldfish eyes, apparently. And so she tells Anastasia the story of the real Mr. Stein, who left 30 years ago after three years of marriage, She and he ran off with a mandolin player. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Gertrude Stein doesn't miss him at all. Don't worry. Yeah, it's a good um, thing. Yeah. So they become more friendly now, and Anastasia offers to do Gertrude Stein's hair for her. Like, she might feel better if she looks better, which is true. And, like, she tells her she can't do her hair and holds right. up her hand. I guess she has really bad arthritis. Right. So. Yeah, so Anastasia's like, no biggie. I can come over and yeah. do it. Because, <laughs> I mean, she doesn't have any friends right now anyway. So, <laughs> But this whole conversation with Gertrude Stein talking about Mr. Stein just leads Anastasia to worrying that she'll have to marry Robert one day. Hmm. Because he's the only boy who likes her. Mm-hmm. But she talks to Awesome Mom about this. And he she soothes her fears. And then right after this conversation, the doorbell rings. And this tall, good-looking boy is there and offering to mow the lawn. His name's Steve Harvey. And he's taller than Anastasia. And they're going to be in the same homeroom. And she's like, mm, maybe things are looking up. <laughs> They make plans to play tennis after he's done with the lawn. And she and her mom's like, you have time to wash your hair. And Hmm. she's just awesome. Yeah, she's like, why don't you go up, wash your hair. I'll take care. I'll talk to him. By the time he's done mowing you, you, you'll have time to finish and dry your hair. She's a good wing woman. Yeah. Awesome mom. (laughs) Um, So that leads us to chapter two of her mystery. 
After she moved to her new home, the young girl began to be more adaptable than she had been in the past. She began to take up tennis as a hobby. <laughs> um, her friend Jenny calls her, and she learns that Jenny's been hanging out with Robert, including seeing Casablanca together at a theater, just like Jenny promised she wouldn't do without Anastasia. So they get a little pissy with each other. But they get over it. And Jenny says that she and Robert are going to ride their bikes over the next weekend. And uh, that leaves Anastasia to worry about Robert meeting the perfectly fine Sam. <laughs> and she tells Awesome Mom about it. And she doesn't get mad. Uh, it, it's just the best reaction. She's like, yeah, this is a problem. Let's have him go over to Gertrude Stein's for the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, not only that, she tells her a story about from her childhood. Oh, yeah, about a misunderstanding. Well, not childhood, well, but... Well, college, I yeah. think it was. Yeah, about a misunderstanding. Yeah, and how she basically had to just stop talking to somebody. She ghosted this dude yeah. because there was some famous artist with the same last name as her. And so she didn't tell this boy that she was related to him, but she didn't tell him she wasn't. And so eventually, <laughs> this artist like died, and she had to like skip school for a few days. So he thinks <laughs> she was at the funeral, and it was just a whole big mess. Yeah. Um, but a good example of uh, not lying, but not a misunderstanding not lying. that you don't correct. <laughs> yes. So she goes up to her room to think about things, and she wants to make it very clear that. Um, she never did anything subversive in her room. Like, <laughs> some kids would smoke cigarettes, but she thought they were gross. Or drink beer. And as we mentioned before, her dad lets her uh, suck the foam off his beer. So it's not a big deal. Or read sexy books. And she's like, we got all sorts of books. Including ones that have sex in them. And I can read them. So, kind of boring. The one thing she has is her notebook, her journal, um, but she's tested her parents, and they don't read them. Um, like, she puts a hair over it so that she'd know if it was open, and they hadn't been. Well, uh, Sam had read it, had <laughs> opened well, it. Well, I hadn't, yeah. But he didn't know how to read, so he could. Yet. You yeah. lucky. Did your kids have journals? Diaries? Whatever. <sighs> Well, I, at times, but they never really did it. You know, that's one of those things where huh. they do it a couple of days and yeah. that was ah. it. Did you uh, ever read them? I don't remember. Possibly. <gasps> I don't remember. That's terrible. I would never. You would never, huh? No. It's such a betrayal <laughs> of trust. <laughs> Uh, my mom read my diary. Yeah? Yeah, at least once. And I got in trouble for it because I was swearing in it. Oh. I was like 9, 10 or something. Yeah, and, I had a friend. And I might have been talking about like my dad or her or something. Um, but I, yeah, I never trusted leaving anything out like that out. I had a friend in high school who um, had kept a journal for years and... Um, she sat behind me in one class one year, and she would tell me uh, what was going on in her life, and mm -hmm. she would write it all in a journal. And sometimes I was like, "You really need to like turn that into a book someday." Mm -hmm. And nice. her mom found it, <gasps> and she had apparently been seeing a um, an older man at this time. Oh, well, and that she had met in theater. The fucking theater. He played the guy from music, the main guy from music band. Oh, Harold Hill. <laughs> and uh, got trouble, my friend, right here in River City. <laughs> and her mom said she was going to take the journals to the police, and so <gasps> she ended up burning all of her oh. journals just to keep. Oh, dramatic. From, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, okay. I guess it's a good <laughs> thing in that case. I guess, but also in her room, she. There's like three layers of wallpaper in her new room, so she strips it off when she's thinking. And I have such a visceral, visceral memory of doing the same in one of our houses. Yeah. Yeah. My basement room <laughs> had like the ugliest. I don't, it was like brown and beige and just gross. Mm. 
but it stripped off real easy. So I did that for quite a long time. (laughs) My recollections of peeling off wallpaper have never been positive. (laughs) No, not when it's something like you have to do. Yeah, Yeah, that's not a good thing. But I I could do it, so I did. Yeah. Yeah. There's only one layer, though. So she continues in Chapter 2 of her novel... Unfortunately, just as the young girl began to live a new and well-adapted life, her past began began to catch up with her and to get tangled up with her future. So Anastasia is disappointed her new library doesn't have her favorite book on leprosy. Mm. She liked to check it out every few months to make sure she didn't have it herself. She's such a little weirdo. Um, but man... Thank you, present. I love being able to suggest titles online for our library to buy. Um, So far, I've gotten them to buy three. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah, I I think I've been done the same three so far. The latest one is like, it's a series of like seven books, and they only had the first one. And I'm like, what? So I just requested they order the second, and they did. And I'm waiting on it to come in. I'm very excited. (laughs) But anyway, she's... Anastasia has told Gertrude Stein that she needs to make some friends. Um, but she says she doesn't like people. And Anastasia knows she's really just scared. So she gets an idea and goes down to this senior drop-in center, which is next door to the library, and tells the people there about Gertrude Stein. And they're all super nice and cool. And 14 people say they'd be glad to meet her. And so they make plans to go over to Anastasia's on Saturday afternoon. And Anastasia's like, ah, oh, shit. Robert and Jenny are coming that day. What am I going to do? She tries to get Awesome Mom to call Jenny and tell her she has leprosy, Mm. but she won't do it. (laughs) Awesome Mom draws the line somewhere because it's just a bad lie. (laughs) Chapter 3. In her new life, the young girl began to meet new people. A tall tennis player with blue eyes. An old woman who looked like a witch. A mysterious band of people who held regular meetings. And who were stricken with astonishment when the young girl showed up unexpectedly at their hideout one day. At the same time, people from her past were still on her trail. The young man with the puzzling briefcase had found out where she lived. And she received a message that he was on his way. He was bringing with him an Irish woman with a chip tooth. So Sam's going around being annoying with a flashlight, turning it off and on and saying, Flash! He and Gertrude Stein are going to play a game called Flasher. And, you know, just like Flasher, um, flashlights at each other from their houses. Much like Marianne and Christy (laughs) in the Babysitter's Mm -hmm. Club. They don't have a code, but it's basically the same thing. Anastasia helpfully informs him um, as to what an actual Flasher, as in the naked kind in a trench coat is which i thought was going to be a much larger problem in adulthood <laughs> than it actually is that people would just come up and flash you or yes, you would because feel the it need was to go around being naked and yeah, it's kind of like quicksand <laughs> there were so many right. stories based around it mm-hmm. you just really thought it was going to be a problem mm-hmm. when you got grew up yeah there were in a lot of stories quicksand yeah. and flashers you're right so, through a confusing mix-up, um, Awesome Mom knows that a group of Anastasia's new friends are coming over, but she doesn't know that they're senior citizens, and she's actually uh, kind of afraid they're a gang and will be arriving on motorcycles. <laughs> because she told them she found them at their clubhouse and yeah. they were playing cards. <laughs> and this leads her and Anastasia to get just so deliciously snarky and sarcastic with each other. And somebody calls and Anastasia goes, is it the motorcycle gang? Did they ask for the gun mall? And she goes, it's Steve Harvey. I should have told him you were out stealing hubcaps. <laughs> and Anastasia's like, oh, I'm sure my friends, are pro- my, my friends might be bringing vodka to put in the Kool-Aid. But Steve is calling um, to, ask to ask her to spend the day with her family, who she's been really wanting to meet. Um, His sister's a ballerina, his dad's a famous sports announcer, and her mom is the prosecutor who prosecuted an axe murderer once. But they're only able to do it Saturday, and Anastasia's like, oh, I'm so very busy. Chapter 4. Who was the young man with the mysteriously blinking light? And what role was the cruel, subversive woman with blue paint on her chin going to play in all of this? Meaning awesome mom. 
The tall bearded stranger sipped thoughtfully at a beer with his eyes closed, listening to Mozart. Mozart was dead. So Saturday arrives and with it Jenny and Robert and she shows them all over her house and that's super fun. Uh, what's not super fun for the girls is that Robert is wearing rain boots which Anastasia calls rubbers and that makes me giggle hmm. because I'm also 12. <laughs> then the senior citizens show up and there's lots of confusion to begin with but it settles down into like a really dope party. All the seniors are like amazing and hella fun and totally mixing with Jenny and Robert and just having the best time playing piano, dancing around and Yeah, the dad was talking about literature with some a couple of old retired yeah. men and And Robert was talking with these old engineers about something he was planning. Yeah, about rockets or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And yeah. Um, then some were dancing. And one dude was, um, really appreciating his, her mom's artwork <laughs> of a nude. Um, but he thought the boobs could be bigger, so. <laughs> <laughs> so Awesome Mom calls Gertrude Stein to come over, and she brings Sam with her. And she's a little put off at first, but she gets into the swing of things, and it's great. And then Steve Harvey and his family drop by. To meet Anastasia, and they're welcomed into the fun, too. Uh, it just sounds really great. Mr. Harvey does, like, this terrible Howard Cosell impersonation. Things begin to quiet down, and they hear Sam coming down the stairs. He's been hiding this whole time. He appears in the doorway wearing his raincoat, and he, of course, flashes everyone, <laughs> which brings a close to the party. Nobody's mad about it, but, because, uh, I mean... Naked two-year-old's cute, but <laughs> it's a way to close out a party. When, but Anastasia doesn't let Gertrude Stein leave because when she had first told Anastasia about Mr. Stein, the person, she also tells her about her real true love, Edward, who had lived in Anastasia's house. And so when Anastasia and Robert and Jenny were peeling back the wallpaper in her room that day, she found... Edward loved Gertrude always, written on the first layer of wallpaper, and is really sweet. You went aw when I read it to you. <laughs> so yeah, all that's wonderful. She needs to finish up her novel though, and she's telling her mom about it, and she's like, "I don't think I have all the ingredients yet." Like it's a mystery novel, so I put in lots of mysterious characters, but. She was able to put a dead person, Mozart, in. But there's no sex yet. I need some explicit sex. Maybe in chapter five. Mm. <laughs> and she does a lot of dunking on Nancy Drew in this book for yeah. being boring. A boring type of mystery. And there's no sex in it. She's like, come on. What's his name? What's her boyfriend's name? Ned? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. She's like, come on, man. You've been dating forever. <laughs> chapter five. All of the characters were in the same room. Suddenly, creeping silently down from the tower, came a naked man. All he was wearing was a trench coat, and he carried a flashlight. He threw open the door to the room, opened his trench coat, laughed an evil laugh, and disappeared. The tall, bearded man said to everyone, Goodbye. I am going to take a nap now. The blue-eyed tennis player said to the young girl, Goodbye. Do you want to play tennis later if it doesn't rain? The young girl said, Goodbye. Yes, I do. The tall ballerina said, Goodbye. I think I will go to New York now to be in a ballet. The cruel and subversive housewife, who actually turned out to be pretty nice, said, Goodbye. I'm going to watch the Kool-Aid pictures. The woman who looked like a witch, except she didn't anymore, said, Goodbye. I will help you watch the Kool-Aid pictures. Where is my green hat? The bald man who was wearing her green hat took it off and gave it to her. Goodbye, he said. Maybe we could have dinner together some night soon. A whole batch of old people said goodbye, and they went home. Some of them had to babysit their grandchildren. The strange young man wearing a SeaWorld t-shirt said, Goodbye, everyone. I am sorry about the naked, emotionally disturbed man. Where is my briefcase? The Irish woman with the chipped tooth said, Here it is. Don't forget your dumb rubbers. Goodbye, all. The famous sportscaster said, I can't do the impression. 
This is Howard Cosell wishing you goodbye after what has proven to be an eventful this afternoon. This is Howard Cosell <laughs> wishing you. <laughs> that was enjoyable. <laughs> the lady lawyer who had once prosecuted prosecuted an axe murderer said will you stop that ridiculous Howard Cosell imitation goodbye everyone thank you so much for including us the young girl realized after they had all left that there were many different ways to say goodbye that solved the mystery the naked man had a poking out belly button and Mozart was still dead the end (laughs) the end of this book and Anastasia's very good book the mystery of how to say goodbye it's just great and so fun, and I want to be best friends with Anastasia huh. forever. The only problem with this was some really pretty bad ableist language mm, yeah. um, that you do use over and over again. Um, awesome Mom does correct Anastasia for saying deformed, and she said it's, it's handicapped, which isn't correct now. Um, it, it would should be disabled now, um, but it's 1981. That was perfectly acceptable. So, I'm not mad about it. Anastasia does tell Sam that boys can't be pretty after he asks if his curls are pretty. But, I'm going to put that down to her being 12 and it being 81. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't like it now. But, but as we said before, there are tons of other things people find problematic in this book. Sure. Probably still do. But... I think that makes the book what it is and perfect and hilarious. So we got six minutes till the debate. What what are you currently reading? Um, <laughs> so I finished two books. Uh-huh. I finished Kingdom of Ash and Briar, which I was reading mm-hmm. last week, um, and it's oh, yeah. basically a um, it it takes like. Fairy tale themes, but it puts it into a more mature storyline. Oh, it, those are always good. Um, and I, it, re- I had to catch like some of the things that were going on. I had to catch that. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that's from this. Yeah. And it would be like you know like one little piece of it. Like uh, at one point, um, they turn like something into a carriage, and and ah, there's yeah, a yeah. and there's slippers. There's not glass slippers, but they're. There are are slip yeah, anyway. Mm-hmm. Um it was pretty good. Um it was I mean this the story overall was pretty good. I didn't like so much some of the writing style, but no. um so I give it a six and a half out of ten. Um the other book is uh that I finished was Replica, mm-hmm. uh which apparently they've made into a movie in twenty eighteen with <laughs> Keanu Reeves. We need to start making a list of books yeah. that we've read that have been turned into movies that we don't find out until. Yeah, after. So I, I, as I was reading it, I thought maybe that the island. I don't know if you saw that with Scarlett Johansson and. Um, oh, I vaguely remember it, but I didn't see it. Yeah, the you and McGregor, hmm. um, where they are escaping from like a facility, clone facility, or mm-hmm. anything. But it was good. Uh, I. I I enjoyed this one more than the the last one. I'd probably give it a, a seven and a half out of ten. Mm-hmm. But there's something unique about this book in that um, it's actually two stories told from two different viewpoints. And you basically finish the first half and then you turn the book over and flip it upside down and you read the oh, second half. Oh, that's funny. And they say that you can you can either do it like that or you mm-hmm. can read either of the stories first oh. or you can alternate chapters between the two. Cool. Yeah. But you listened to audiobook, right? But I did the audio, so it basically went through yeah. one story and then started the other story mm. with, a, with a different character. Kind of a downfall for that sort of book, but... Yeah, yeah, you know, that you don't have the choice. Yeah. yeah. Would anyway. you have read it differently? Um, I tend to like when things are going on at the same time to do alternating chapters. Yeah. I, I like I probably that would with, too. With, um, with more complex books where you've got a whole bunch of characters. I, I, yeah, I like that mm-hmm. they would alternate chapters. And then you're like, oh, we're finally getting back to the character I really like. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I like that. that. That's good. But uh, the story's... Story's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Writing's pretty good. So, yeah. And then currently I'm reading... Um, still working on fall. <laughs> s- 
to work in a fall. <laughs> I'll, I'll mention that one when I'm done with it. Um, Infinity by Sherilyn Kenyon. And so far it's been pretty good. Uh, mm-hmm. I've enjoyed it. So I finished The Orphan Keeper uh, last week. The Orphan uh, Keeper? Yes. Yeah. So what about the Indian not really orphan? It and it, it was a lot like the movie Lion. Um, but it was very good and emotional and it was based on a true story, so there were pictures at the end and I always love that. I also read Moxie by Jennifer Matthew. And I stayed up until 4 a.m. reading this book all in one sitting because it was so fucking good. Because it was pretty relatable. It's about, um, it came out in 2017. Um, The main character's mom was a riot girl back in the 90s. What does that mean? You didn't know what riot, well, you were all good and Christian and stuff. Uh, It was girls who were into like kind of alternative scene. But they were um, very progressive and feminist, and they um, published zines and e-zines talking okay. about feminism and all that sort of stuff. So this main character, um, she lives in a small East Texas, small Texas town on the coast mm. um, where football rules everything, yeah. and uh, there's lots of misogyny, and the football players get away with it. And it's, yeah, hella relatable, but... So things start happening to her and her friends. And, I mean, some small things like football players saying, go make me a sandwich in the middle of class. and But then um, some assaulty type stuff. And so that spurs her to anonymously uh, start this movement. And it ends up being called Moxie. And other girls start joining in on it. And the spirit of the Riot Girls wasn't that there was a leader. It was just everybody working together for the same thing. And it ends up doing that in this. Um, Mm. Girls from all different cliques and stuff um, start coming together and working together. And it's just really awesome and totally feminist. And I'm going to buy it uh, for Abigail (laughs) and send Mm. it to her. I hope she uses it as maybe a bit of an inspiration at her last two years in a small Texas high school that is very similar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it was just so great. Totally recommend it. Five stars out of five. And right now I am reading The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet, which is the first in a series, The Wayfarers. There are two other ones that have been published already. Um it's sci fi and you're right, it sounds a bit like Firefly. Um but I just read it, started it, so but I'm enjoying it so far. I'll tell you more next week. So, please rate us on Apple Podcasts. <laughs> uh, subscribe to us on there and all the places where you get podcasts um, if you're enjoying. Please, please tell your friends and share us on all the social medias. Um, I updated the website, like, really hardcore this past week. And started Tumblr and Twitter, I mean, and uh, Pinterest and all that. Uh, you can find all our social media links on fightingoverthecardcatalog.com. Our next book is going to be Boy Crazy Stacy, no right, mm. and the Babysitter's Club. <laughs> Fun. Fun. Where are you reading the books of your childhood? So you don't have to. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>